Uh, we can get started. I want to welcome uh, everybody here in person as well as the people online to our first meeting post COVID. We haven't had an in person meeting for almost two years. And uh, <clears throat> this is also, I believe, the first ever hybrid meeting that we have had. So Going forward, if we have meetings in this facility, we can always enjoy the new technology that uh, they have. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, my name is Mohammed Tarani. I'm the, the chair of the AESS the Aerospace Chapter, and uh, we always look for volunteers to help with this chapter as well as other chapters. Um, so if you have the inclination and the time, uh, please come talk to me or to Darren, and uh, we will love to see you be active uh, in, uh, in our trip uh, <clears throat> um, and It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Michael Brodge. Um, and Michael comes all the way from Ohio University, and that's very really appreciated. Uh, it's a treat. We haven't had speakers coming that far <laughs> and to any of our meetings. Uh, Michael is a <coughs> professor of, uh, in the Department of Electrical Engineering Computer Science at the Ohio University. He has over 35 years of experience. Uh, in research and teaching on uh, inertial navigation, and he's a he's lecturer with all the major uh, navigation uh, companies. Uh, so it's really a treat for us to have him here and uh, talk to us about the <coughs> topic of the tonight, which is uh, inertial navigation now and as well as the future. Michael. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Got some folks on the chat here. Let's see if everybody's uh, good to go. Well, uh, well, thank you for. Oops, that didn't work out. Ah, I know what I did. There we go. So, Mohammed, thank you so much for reaching out. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, I'll talk a, a little bit more about myself in a moment. Let me start by uh, just uh, probably preaching to the choir a little bit and uh, bring greetings from, uh, the, um, um, from the Board of Governors of the Aerospace Electronic Systems Society. Um, currently, uh, Mark Davis is serving as president, and um, um, you know, I, I think probably you know, everybody in this group already knows that uh, obviously you know, involvement in professional societies is a key part of uh, staying active and, and staying involved, and engaged in your uh, in your professions. So, uh, but if there's anybody here who's not an IEEE member, we certainly highly highly recommend that you. Uh, that you not only join IEEE, but that you uh, but that you join AESS as well. A lot of offerings, of course. There's a lot of major conferences that uh, that specifically are sponsored by AESS. Uh, on Tiscon always happens end of uh, August. Aerospace conference, very very popular conference held in March in Big Sky, Montana. Um, Go for the awesome technical talks, and then oh, by the way, do some skiing since you're out there. It's a, it's a fantastic gig. Uh, folks that are interested in radar, of course, big you know a lot of radar offerings uh, from AESS, and certainly recommend that. Uh, you're probably already familiar with our publications, of course, the transactions. Everybody knows about uh, magazine. A lot of a lot of great uh, practical articles in there. Uh, you hopefully are opening your QEBs when they come in the mail, uh, the email, a lot of uh, interesting articles there as well, uh, quarterly, quarterly email blasts, 
and uh, certainly encourage you to uh, open those up when uh, when they come in your inbox. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Distinguished Lecturer Program, AESS, uh, as a process where they, they select folks that uh, can, uh, can offer a wide variety of topics, and, and through that, uh, Mohammed reached out to me. As I said, it's a, it's a delight for me to be here. And, uh, and there's a lot of other folks that you might consider uh, reaching out to that, uh, that you would uh, find their presentations fascinating as well. If you're not already familiar with this, IEEE has a learning network, and you can get to that. Of course, well, of course you have to be an IEEE member. Uh, hint, hint. <laughs> and then uh, you can log on to the website. And once you've logged on to the website, then you have access to the learning network. Uh, there are courses that are free for uh, ADSS members. Uh, you can get to it from Explore. We have a new LinkedIn page uh, and dedicated for members, events, news, things of that nature are in there. IEEE AESS also has a resource center. And again, uh, you get access to it from uh, the website and uh, encourage you to check that out. Now, this is an interesting initiative that came up uh, oh, no, four or five years ago uh, where they decided that the, the, the you know, the whatever 45 minute talks that are given on a normal you know evening are nice but sometimes more intensive coverage is appropriate uh and so they developed this short course opportunity and, and basically what happens is you know the local chapters and sections are the ones that obviously are plugged into the have, have the best engagement with the local industry and you know needs and things of that nature. So you can have a situation where you know the members say, hey, you know, there's some, you know, we've got some companies in the area, or maybe just a company in the area that could really benefit from uh, an, an intensive short course uh, on the topic that hey, ADSS knows all about. And so you can what you can do is uh, set up through, the, there's there's a number of short courses that are already on the books, more can be added, but effectively what happens is um, AESS offers this short course to, you know, either, either, either done at the section or the or chapter, or in fact, even done on site at a particular company. Uh, obviously it's benefiting the folks that are attending, but also, uh, there's uh, the uh, some of the funding that comes from the, the attendees. You know, it, it's something that has to be paid for, but some of that funding goes straight back to the uh, chapter and section, and and so it's it's a way that you know you can help, you know, provide some funding for local activities and things of that nature, and then serve the community at the same time. So something worth checking out. We have a professional networking mentoring program. This is great for students and young professionals. Uh, and so we, uh, we highly encourage that. And of course, uh, there are a number of awards that uh, AESS gives out. And something that has been supremely frustrating to the awards committee um, is that uh, we know that there are, there are Whole lot of deserving folks out there, uh, but it's hard to get nominations. That's been a frustrating thing. Uh, so certainly, uh, we encourage the sections and chapters to be thinking about. You know, there's probably somebody you know that yeah, they probably ought to get recognized. You know, and 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 we can certainly help with the, you know, giving information on putting together nominations and things of that nature. So we certainly encourage. Them. And that is the beginning. So let's put that away. And whoops, <laughs> maybe that's not what I wanted to do. I'll come back. All right, so let's go back to where is it? Green button. Green button. We're here. Ah, yes, 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 thank you. 
There we go. So that should be working. Both hearing is sharing. Okay. 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 So uh, just to give you a little, little, little bit more background on need, but in addition to what uh, Muhammad mentioned, uh, about 13 years ago, I uh, was talking to Bill Brewer. If you haven't met Bill already, he is with the, what is now Northern Grumman. Uh, he was joined, joined Lytton in 1978, if I remember, and we were doing inertial navigation for McDonnell Douglas for about 10 years prior to that. So. Uh, anyway, uh, back in back in 2008 or so, uh, Phil and I were chatting, and out of that discussion, there was uh, um, a, a relationship developed between Northrop and Ohio University. And I've been coming out here uh, about every month or two uh, for the last 13 years. <laughs> so uh, working working with Northrop that whole time, uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, a relationship, and so when when Muhammad uh, said, "Hey, could you give us a talk?" I said, "Well, as a matter of fact, I'm in your neighborhood on a regular basis, so that that will not be a problem. Well, I'm happy happy to do it." So uh, you know, I've had the privilege to be involved in inertial navigation, navigation in general since the '80s, but inertial navigation in particular since the late '90s, and uh, I. I start this talk with a little bit of fear and trepidation because I understand there's a whole lot of current or ex little people here that <laughs> it's like I, I'm, I'm definitely preaching to the choir tonight somewhat. Uh, hopefully I'll have some things to say that uh, either will be new or perhaps a, a nice refresher. Uh, and I also hope to uh, finish early enough that uh, uh, there'll be time for questions and uh, look forward to that. So without any further ado, <laughs> We're going to talk about why we bother with inertial navigation in the first place. We're going to go through the overview of the navigation principles. Then we'll talk about uh, errors, and that leads us into why we need to aid inertial systems, provide some additional uh, systems that, that either you can think of it as integration or fusion is the top word nowadays, but so basically systems that will aid the inertial. Uh, and then if there's that time, I may touch a little bit about some current things I'm doing, but definitely want to make sure we have time for questions. So why do we bother with inertial navigation? And the answer is that with one sensor suite, you're determining position, velocity, and attitude all out of the same sensor suite. It is, for all practical purposes, immune to interference and jamming which is a hot topic these days with GPS. Uh, you know, it's, if, if, you want to, if, if you want to talk about frying the electronics in the unit with an electromagnetic pulse or something like that, yeah, I'll be fine. But, but I don't call them interference. I don't call them a whole different things. So for all practical purposes, it's completely immune to interference in jamming. High data rates. Now, why is that important? Well, if you're a flight control person, it's really important. Right, that's that's uh, that makes a whole lot of difference, and and it's it's there along the way. Low well, data latencies again, same thing for the flight control purposes. You want both high data rates, low data latencies. It's exactly what inertial navigation gives you. And in the short term, it's practically noise free. Uh, yeah, that noise at the rate level, but by the time you've integrated it twice to get the position, it's practically noiseless. But of course, there is one Achilles heel with inertial navigation, and that is that it has poor long term accuracy. It's basically dead reckoning. And if you're dead reckoning, of course, any errors will just accumulate over time. It's not stable, it will gradually get worse and worse and worse if left to itself. Uh, and so the errors here do indeed grow over time. Now, how much they grow over time? It's how much money do you have? <laughs> you try to do inertial navigation with this thing, it's going to drift off at about a mile per second. You know, if you um, if you use the 
systems that Northrop is currently putting into fighter aircraft. It's going to be drifting off at about a nautical mile per hour. Uh, I will come back to that. Yeah, hold on, hold that twice for a minute. We'll come back to that. Um, if you have the airship system that they put in ballistic missile submarines, it's going to drift off at maybe a tenth of a nautical mile per hour or something like that. So it's all a question of how much money you have, but no matter what, it drifts off over time. One well, Achilles heel in inertia. So this is an example uh, of a real system. And the, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the 101E, that was, that was a commercial system, right? Right, yep. yeah. So this was, this was a commercial system. Uh, these are three ring lines of gyros inside the cans. And then basically the, the um, uh, you can't see where the accelerometers are too small, but then we have all the support electronics, you know, size of a couple loaves of bread, basically. So, so you have two choices in dealing with the long term error uh, growth. One is simply to live with it. And in the old days, that's what they did. You, you, particularly if you're talking about Oceanic, if you had a, you had a commercial aircraft leaving, whatever, leaving New York and flying to London or leaving Los Angeles and flying to uh, you know, Honolulu or Honolulu flying to Hong Kong or something like that. And this is, you know, pick a date, 1965 or something like that, um, 1975. You've got the inertial system, and pretty much that's it. Now, the military may have access to uh, star trackers and celestial systems, but you know, the average commercial aircraft, they were, they were stuck with, with whatever the inertial system could provide. And it's drifting off at a couple of nautical miles per hour. So be it. They would set up the lane widths wide enough that adjacent aircraft would hit each other. Uh, and and you, just, you just live with the aircraft. Now, if you're traveling, 4,000 miles, and at the end of the trip, you're only off by 20. That's a good deal. <laughs> that's, that's a good trade off. You can, you can live with that in many circumstances. But there are situations where that's not acceptable. You need to do something better than that. And so the second option is to integrate the system with some kind of external independent source of, when I say position here, that's the preferable case, you can aid with other things as well, but, but position or something uh, related to position is, is the best. And that will correct or aid the inertial system. Now, assuming that's what you want to do, then the question, ah, well, what's the optimal way to do that integration? And will the integration accommodate a wide variety of aiding sources? That's what we're going to talk about. So let's start off by, uh, for the folks that know this stuff already, a brief review of inertial navigation, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. Now, it starts off as a deceptively simple problem. We measure force and infer acceleration. The integrate once to get velocity, integrate one more time to get position. It's like, I learned that in you know, the first semester of physics. What's, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal, of course, is it's way more complicated than it sounds at first. Number one is the fact that we cannot measure acceleration directly. What we measure with the we call an accelerometer, which itself is a misnomer, what we actually measure is specific force. And that specific force is the vector sum of the desired inertial acceleration what we want. And this is, it looks like it's you're subtracting off gravity. That's not actually what it is. <laughs> what this actually is is the vector sum of inertial acceleration and the reaction to gravity. It's you're adding those two things. This minus sign really needs to get buried in there because you can't pull it out. You're not measuring gravity directly, you're measuring the reaction to gravity. It's like I'm not I'm not I'm not measuring if, if you put the accelerometer on the table and what is it what does it measure? Well, it, it measured a force in the up direction. 
Why is that? Because it's measuring the case holding the holding the thing in place, right? The, the if you're you're not free falling, why? You know, because something's holding you up. And that's that's what you're actually measuring in, in the absence of inertia of uh, Newtonian acceleration. What you're actually what you're measuring is the reaction to gravity. And uh, so anyway, the point is that you have to deal with gravity. Now, surely everybody here is old enough to remember this. this I, 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 I love this. <laughs> you said you, you, you remember, remember it was a take, it was a parody on remember 55 miles an hour. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. You remember that, you know, those those uh, 1980s advertising, well, somebody came along and decided, hey, gravity is not just a good idea, it's the law. So anyway, um, you have to take that accelerometer sensing equation, turn it around a little bit, because what we want, of course, is the inertial, uh, the Newtonian acceleration. So we take the specific force that we measure, and then we have to compute and add in gravity. To, to compensate our measurements in order to extract acceleration. Now, if you go back in the old, old days, they decided this problem was sufficiently difficult that they didn't even bother mechanizing a vertical channel. Now, the, the, the inertia systems of the 1950s were two channel systems, right? You put your, you had a gimbal platform, which we'll get to in a minute, and you put an accelerometer point at north and an accelerometer point at east, and that was it. He didn't even bother with the bird, just, just ignored it. So, they, you know, they, that's what barometric altimeters are for, is to give me altitude. I, you know, they, the inertia system, I needed the horizontal velocity. So, they didn't even bother. But, of course, it didn't take very long before folks said, hey, you know, vertical velocity is useful. <laughs> Why don't we figure out some way to stabilize the inertial vertical channel? Well, that's fine, but we, then the first thing we have to do is compensation. Uh, your measurements in order to uh, in order to uh, get the acceleration. No, Einstein would say that gravity is a force, but a warping of space time. Well, I I, I will not disagree with that. Um, but uh, since my PhD is in engineering and not physics, I'm not going to get into that in, in great detail. But uh, but the whole whole argument that. Uh, so the point is that you have to be able to compute, uh, you have to be able to compute gravity in order to compensate the measurements in order to get your, uh, uh, in order to get your acceleration out. All right, well, I mentioned gimbals, and that's how this all got started. The idea was that if we could, uh, if we could spin up some gyros and attach the accelerometers to a platform, uh, that had gimbals so that it was free to rotate, get the gyros spun up so that it's inertially stabilized, then you let the vehicle rotate around it as it pitches, rolls, and changes orientation, but you hold that platform locally level. Put one accelerometer point north, one point east, and, and you know, then the problem uh, becomes significantly easier. So, Mechanical gyros are used to maintain the orientation of the platform, keep those three accelerometers pointed in a local level and, and local vertical direction. That's, that was inertial navigation for the first three decades, 50s, 60s, 70s, well, and into the 80s, almost the first four decades. Uh, that was inertial navigation. But there was the, the concept of strap down had been identified only even before World War II, but we didn't have the computational resources to be able to do it until you know, the 1970s. The idea of a strap down system is that, as the name implies, the accelerometers are, are fixed to the case. The case is hard mounted to the vehicle. And so the accelerometers are pointing wherever the vehicle happens to be pointing. Okay, well, if you do that, that means you need to be able to estimate the current orientation of the platform or the vehicle so that you can then resolve the accelerometer measurements from wherever they happen to be pointing, resolve them into 
directions of interest, north, east, down, that kind of thing. Which will in a trend system, the gyros now are being used to determine the attitude. Whereas in the mechanical system, the purpose of the gyros was to keep the platform in place. And you can read off attitude, but the, the purpose of the mechanical gyros was okay, I want this platform to stay still, regardless of what the vehicle happens to be doing. So they're both gyros, but they're used for entirely different purposes, in a sense. All right. So uh, yeah, well, let's see if this will play. Okay, this is. We're going to come back to this. So, let's see if I can share that. Question is, I don't know if this is showing up on the. Uh... Uh, no, it's not. Yeah, so in part, you have to stop sharing. Okay, I do have to stop. Okay, all right. You have to share the entire video screen. All right, that's well, like this. Yeah, in part. Yeah, you can share the Okay, so that should work. All right, so this is a Litany training video, and it's showing the uh, was it the LN3? Is that this what this was? LN3, LN12. LN12. Okay, and and so you, you actually get to see what a real gimbal system looked like. <laughs> You can't really see the accelerometers very well. They are located way down here inside of the inside the middle of the stable element, but there are three of them. And you can see the gimbal of this platform. Here is roll, pitch, and azimuth. All right, so that um, that that showed you the the basic idea of the you know you have the gyros and you have the gimbals to be able to rotationally isolate uh, the platform, which is what the uh, accelerometers are mounted on, from the rest of the vehicle. What I want to show you now is what happens when that thing's actually running, and. That's all I meant to do. Question is, is 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 that showing up? No audio. Okay. All right. Uh, I was afraid of that. So uh, in the previous for the folks online for the uh, uh, previous video, uh, all all the gentleman was saying was he was he was pointing to the two gyros and then showing the the different gimbals and the way that the platform could rotate. So. Uh, you, you didn't miss that much by not hearing what the what the fellow was saying. Uh, for the, the second video, it doesn't matter a bit if you can't understand what he's saying because he's speaking in Dutch. So, um, and uh, all he's going to say is he's he's going to he's going to do a, a quick count, either one two three or three two one, and then he's going to turn it off. Uh, what it will do is it will immediately uh, come to a, an initial course level. And then in, in the video doesn't show the, the alignment process, but then it cuts to the technician picking the platform up and then rotating it. And what you will see is that the inner element stays level even while the technician is moving it around and simulating pitch roll and yaw of the vehicle. It's an old video, it's low resolution. I apologize. It's the best I've got. <laughs> and, and just bear with me.
noise. And it's way too noisy. Yeah. <laughs> the noise is going to get right there. But they're noisier than that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds makes that kind of noise. Yeah, yeah. With, with, with the gyros are spinning and then all, all of this stuff is running on a 400 hertz uh, modulated servo. So you got all this 400 hertz noise down there. And then there's blower. There's a fans in there circulating air and whatnot. So inner noise. But it, it, it gives you a physical picture of what we're talking about here because, of course, for the last 40, well, in the last 30 plus years, it's all been done in software. <laughs> so you, you, there's nothing to look at, but, but being able to see an actual gimbal system working, uh, I've, I've always found to be uh, rather useful. Uh, okay, are the rotating wheels the analog sensors? No, those, 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 that's, it's all controlled with an analog computer. So there's no digital computer here. It's all that an analog computer. So those little wheels were the ends of what we used to call shaft assemblies, like integrators, right? Okay. And, and yeah, so it's, it's all... So geared. those are basically uh, analog integrators. Analog integrators. Gotcha. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, actually, okay. No, a little Sure, sure. Oh. So my question was that... Uh, the objective of this device is yeah. that you have the initial decision, and you are from that point, the reference point, you're calculating where you're going. Right. That makes it well, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, again, uh, if, if I have an accelerometer and I've compensated it for gravity, so I'm actually measuring the Newtonian acceleration in a particular direction. For our basic physics, of course, you integrate acceleration once, you get velocity, you integrate velocity, you get position. But it means that you've got to keep track of, yeah, but I, I need to know acceleration in a particular reference direction. And so it's very, and, and for obviously for two dimensional movements, then you know the easiest way to do this is to have two orthogonal accelerometers. Yeah, and and to make it even more convenient, maybe if I put one of them pointed in the north direction and I have another one pointed in the east direction, then obviously I integrate those guys once and I get east and north velocity directly. But if I integrate it again with a little bit more uh, math, then of course integrating north velocity is going to give me a change of latitude. And integrating these velocity will give me a change of longitude. And so I'm able to you know, compute both my position and velocity. But the catch is you've got to have those accelerometers pointing in the desired reference direction in order to just be able to continually integrate the output. And so the way they did this to begin with was with the mechanical gimbal system and that way those accelerometers were, were fixed in the in the direction of interest um nowadays we've got to, you know they're they're pointed in some arbitrary direction and then they got to figure out the mathematical transformation and say okay what's the equivalent output if it, if it was in the local level does that help yes okay if the earth was flat this problem would be lots of <laughs> Okay, so there was a question. It looked like it did a 180 degree flip. Is that to avoid gimbal lock? Yes. And the answer is yes. If you only had three gimbals, then you would have this thing called gimbal lock, which it's hard for me to show here because I don't have the right props. Um, but essentially what happens is you get two of the axes become uh, collinear and, and then you lose, you, you basically lose a degree of freedom when that happens. And, that, and, and the, the classic way that happens is that you pitch all the way up to 90 degrees. If you think about it, you know, yaw is a, is a rotation around the vertical and pitch is a rotation around the wings of the plane. The roll is a rotation around the long axis of the plane. But if you pitch all the way up to 90 degrees, then your your roll axis is collinear with the with with what is supposed to be your yaw axis, and bad things happen. It's called gimbal lock. So the question online was: uh, you saw that the 
the system flipped 180 degrees when the technician brought it all the way up to vertical and the answer in, in the, the question is spot on uh, that there was a there's there's two roll vehicles right the, the yeah, roll vehicle and the outer roll vehicle and so when you pitched up to 180 degrees in the inner roll vehicle flips 180 in order to avoid the, the gimbal lock so yeah these most of these platforms are four gimbal platforms so you roll Pitch as with an interval, and in, in the pitch gimbals suspended in the interval gimbals over here. Up oh, 90 degrees, you still have the interval gimbal that gives you maybe 15 or 20 degrees of freedom while the platform is rotating around and getting itself oriented right. It's the infamous gimbal flip. Where is that? I can see that. From the time that actual motion happens to the time you actually know the position. Oh, wow. It's so, okay. So I can, I can speak a little bit. You can talk about the gimbal ones, but I can speak a little bit more authoritatively on the strap down systems. Uh, and so, for example, uh, the gyros and accelerometers typically in current strap down, modern strap down systems. Uh, gimbals and accelerometers will output raw data at something on the order of a kilohertz. Uh, and then the updating of the or computation of the attitude may happen, oh, let's say roughly on the order of maybe one or 200 hertz, depends on the dynamics of the vehicle. And then maybe your velocity and position is getting computed at maybe. 50 or 100 hertz, something like that. The only reason to do it slower is that the, the, the downstream user usually doesn't need it faster. And then so you're wasting energy to, to compute it faster. But if you if, if you say, well, okay, I've got uh, position at 100 hertz, uh, the latency is, is uh, well, it's, I mean, it's milliseconds or less. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really just a question of how fast you can do that computation. So earlier I was saying that not only is the data rate high, but the data latency is very low. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's virtually instantaneous. The only, the only time, you, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the only time that it would become uh, an issue is if you were talking about an ultra high dynamic platform. But in that case, of course, you can compute it because there's a lot of the attitude a lot faster anyway. Um, but uh, you know, for, for most ships, boats, airplanes, you know, things of that nature, it's, it, it can virtually be considered instantaneous. But you know, to get a number, some few milliseconds, I would say. Well, that's a different matter. Yeah, if you're talking about a high dynamic platform, then you need to be you, you need to be doing all the computations at a higher rate. Of course, number one. Um, I mean, it's limited. It's 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 limited by the data rate of the raw sensor, which, as I said, is typically on the order of kilohertz. And then and then it's just you know okay, how fast is your is your computational capability? And the the, the it's not it's not terrible that i mean doing this hundreds of times a second of course is an issue but any one particular update is not terribly computationally intensive so yeah late, latency is just typically not even for the high dynamic stuff you just have to do it more often that's that's all that's that's a great question so we've got uh, some more things that we have to address. Uh, we said, well, okay, I want to, I want to be able to, want to be able to measure force, pull out the gravity, integrate a couple of times to get velocity and, and position. And say, well, okay, so we wanted to point these things in, in reference directions, but it's not that simple because if I had a if I had a perfect gimbal system, perfect gimbals, perfect gyros, and so the platform is, is level, and doesn't matter what the vehicle does, that platform stays level. And, and, and just for the sake of the argument, assume these things are perfect. 
it's not enough because the earth rotates and it's spherical. And there's some other impacts that I'll mention briefly. So, first of all, let's talk about Earth. Rate. Let's imagine we're looking at the Earth from the top. This is the North Pole that's sticking out. And let's say that we've got a vehicle on the equator, just to make the illustration easy. And this, these, these rectangles are there just notionally to give you an orientation of the platform, the gimbal platform. And let's presume that that gimbal platform is, as I said, it's perfect, absolutely perfect. So what happens six hours later? And let's say the thing sits. Let's let's say the vehicle is sitting still. Six hours later, the Earth is rotated ninety degrees. The Earth and the vehicle have all rotated ninety degrees relative to an area of space. But we said we had a perfect gimbal system. So that perfect gimbal system stays in the same orientation. That's what we thought we wanted, right? We had these perfect gyros and perfect gimbal, so it stayed completely rotationally isolated from the vehicle. Ah, but what happens? It started off, it was locally leveled. Six hours later, the whole room is rotated 90 degrees. Well, I didn't want that. Well, you can't have it both ways, right? It's, it doesn't, the guy, the jurors don't care what you're ro rotationally isolating yourself from. If it's vehicle motion or if the entire Earth is rotating, the jurors don't care. Okay? So that means that in a gimbal system, what you had to do is you had to physically torque the platform. And they have these things called torquers. Okay. Yeah. And, and so you, you, you had to physically rotate the platform for the purposes of keeping it locally level to account for the fact that the earth was rotating. Now, the same thing happens when you're moving over the surface of the Earth. If the vehicle is traversing the surface of the Earth, even though the passengers think you're level, in reality, you're actually rotating as you're moving over the surface of this curved Earth. And so, again, the gimbals and the gyros don't care. They, they, they will, they will be, if they were perfect, they would ignore that rotation. And that's not what you want. <laughs> you want it to stay locally level, and the problem, as Phil was mentioning before, is you don't live on a flat earth. And so uh, local level changes orientation as you move over the surface of the earth. So you have to compensate both for earth rate and craft rate. And then finally, you also have to deal with what we call Coriolis. And that is the fact that your actual path curves in space as a function of your velocity and the rotation rate of the, of the, the frame of interest, which for us is the frame is fixed to the earth. So all these things have to be taken into account. You can't just take acceleration and integrate twice and be done with it. It's not that simple. All right, now, the last thing is that gravity isn't as simple as, as we were taught when we were in school, not, not in a certain grade school or high school. Uh, and, and that is the fact that you know, we, we, when we're young, we're taught that you know, two masses will have, will have an attraction you know, to each other, mass attraction. And that's fine, that's absolutely correct. But that's not all that we have to deal with. The fact of the matter is that because the Earth is rotating, we're all experiencing this centripetal acceleration, which is a function of our latitude. And, 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 and any given mass is experiencing the vector sum of both the mass attraction and the centripetal acceleration. And when you combine those two, that's what we actually call gravity. If you want to get precise about it, mass attraction is actually gravitation 
And the vector sum of gravitation and centripetal acceleration is gravity. Now, we frequently, uh, within, within inertial navigation, we will distinguish between what we call gravity and what we call effective gravity or local gravity. Now, in reality, gravity is gravitation and effective gravity is just gravity <laughs> if you talk to a scientist. But no inflection. We talk about effective gravity as being that, that vector sum of those, those two effects. Now, you may say, wait a minute. Uh, you told me you got a PhD and you got this word centripetal up there, and everybody knows there's no such thing. Yes, but it turns out that because we are interested in in positioning and navigating with respect to the Earth, usually space people, that's a different story. But the folks that are working on the Earth itself, we're interested in positioning with respect to the Earth. And because the Earth is rotating, it is not an inertial reference frame. And that messes with the mathematics. And at the end of the day, from the viewpoint of the rotating reference frame, which is the Earth, from the viewpoint of the Earth, the effect appears to be outward rather than inward. And we all know centripetal acceleration points into the center of the circle. But you do all the math, and it turns out that, that from the viewpoint of the Earth, it looks like it's, it's, it's acting outward. So that's why we talk about the centripetal acceleration, bring those two together. All right. So I've just covered about 10 weeks worth of my uh, graduate course in inertial navigation. And so what we're done with now is the total uh, process, which I put in continuous time form because it's easier to view. So in the upper left, we've got the angular rate of the body frame relative to the inertial frame. So that's what the gyros measure, measuring the you know, rotation. And so you integrate that a bit with C, that's the direction cosine matrix. It's a way to represent attitude between the other angles, you can use direction cosines, you can use quaternions, there's different ways to do it. I usually use direction cosine matrices. And it's the body frame, the vehicle frame relative to the nav frame, which is the local level frame. And I want to update that guy. Well, it's driven by the uh, it's driven by the gyros. And then what do we have out here? Earth rate and transport rate. Transport rate is that rotation because you're moving over the surface of your curve. So all that has to be taken into account to get, to get your updated attitude. Now, with your updated attitude, you can then take the specific force that you're measuring from your three orthogonal accelerometers, and you can update velocity. And you can see that velocity is not just a matter of it's not just a matter of integrating the accelerometer output. Yeah, you got the accelerometers. You got to compensate it for the gravity. And then you got the Coriolis correction, which is a function of the transport rate of the Earth. Integrate that. We've got our updated velocity. With velocity, we can then uh, compute the rotation rate of the local level frame relative to the Earth frame which is actually how we keep track of position change. And so when we integrate that, we'll skip all the math because we don't have time, but we have a separate direction cosine matrix that relates the earth frame, uh, earth center, earth fixed frame, or whatever, it's earth frame to the local level frame. And from that, we can extract latitude and longitude. Don't really have time to talk about water angle, but I can give you a hint. I've been talking about trying to keep accelerometers pointed north and east. What happens if you're up at the North Pole? Every direction is south, right? It doesn't matter where you're pointed, every direction is south. So it's hard to do this, to keep, a, keep two accelerometers pointed north and east when every direction is south. So there's a, there's a modification to the technique uh, called water angle. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that. But this, of course, you know, moves on itself because the previous results are going to be used in order to compute the next value. But we've updated attitude, velocity, and position. And uh, we haven't used any external 
sensors, just the accelerometers and the gyros. Yes, please. So uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you get the drift. Mm -hmm. Right. Which term in this equation is contributing to that drift? Uh, well, I'm going to talk about errors in a minute, so it's a great question. Uh, but the answer to your question uh, is that uh, both of the sensors, gyros and the accelerometers, uh, have errors in them. You're not, not perfect, obviously. So they have noise, they have uh, bias errors, they have scale factor errors, uh, they have the, each of the, the, the six sensors have all sorts of errors. Uh, and even after lab calibration, factory calibration, they still have errors in the run. Even during the run, these things change value uh, slightly. So the, the primary driver is the errors in the sensors. That's the biggest thing. Now, after that, we don't actually know gravity perfectly. So we will end up having an error in our gravity compensation. So even if we had perfect gyros and accelerometers, we probably don't know gravity perfectly. And then you say, well, don't we know it good enough? Well, it turns out that uh, if, if, if you're off by 50 millionths of the value of gravity, that's a big deal. Uh, so uh, that's the kind of scale we're talking about. So those are the biggest things in, in, in terms of the drivers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That uh, that you're using you're, you're using your previous your previous values of latitude, maybe extrapolating to the current interval in order to compute uh, transport rate. Uh, yeah, I also slipped it in here. If you didn't notice. Uh, it, of course, it's a continuous time differential equation. But if I get the discrete time update. What this equation is saying is that I don't need to know velocity in order to compute velocity. That's problematic, right? So, um, so how do you get that? Well, same thing. You use your previous values and extrapolate to the current interval, and you know, that's good enough. Because if, 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 if you if you do a sensitivity analysis, you'll see that this term is pretty small. Now, it's not negative. That's pretty small. So, you know, your previous value velocity, you extrapolate your previous value velocity. Yeah, great question. All right. So, uh, like I said, I, I, feel, I feel that's so very straight. This is, this is perfect. You, you were asking about errors. And that is absolutely what we need to talk about because the previous block diagram, you know, it's all that. But wait a minute. Yeah, none of these things are perfect. Um, so, First thing we have to do is actually characterize the error uh, because when we're aiding this system, we need those models. So where do we get our errors from? Well, as I just mentioned uh, here, sensor errors and gravity errors, those are the biggest ones by far. There are others, you know, the sensors, we may not know exactly where they are within the box, uh, the box may not be known perfectly with respect to the vehicle that affects more attitude. Attitude that the flight control system is what that has to do with. Uh, we do have it's, it's a dead reckoning system. How are you going to get your position velocity and attitude to begin with? There are ways to do it. I mean, obviously, if you're sitting at a survey location, that gives you position. Assuming you're sitting still, that gives you velocity. But you still have to initialize attitude, and you don't do that perfectly. So that would, but but that's somewhat driven by the sensor. So it's it's the sensor errors and the gravity model errors that are the biggest drivers. Uh, in the old days, computational errors was an issue that's less of a problem today with you know modern computational capability. But you still have to be careful to to do the do the algorithms properly. So this is, oh, let's see, we've got a chat. So let's take a look. OK, 
Okay, how much error is introduced by the actual ellipsoid shape of the Earth, as well as the variations of the gravity field at differing locations? All right. Um, I, I can see that I've, I've, I've got the graduate students here, <laughs> which is, this is great. Uh, this, is, this is good stuff. Uh, so, okay, so the fact that the, the Earth is an ellipsoid, um, obviously, you know, when we were in school, you know, literally, we said, oh, gravity's 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, okay, that's a global average, right? Uh, and, and so, in reality, uh, because of the ellipsoid, then Gravity, even at the surface, gravity is a function of latitude. Uh, you get the, the Earth is bulged out a bit at the equator, and so so the magnitude of gravity, even if you had a perfectly mass homogeneous Earth, with the assumption that it's ellipsoid, then then gravity would still be a function of latitude. So that's the first thing. Uh, so that's the ellipsoid. Now. The varying uh, the variation of the gravity field at different locations, that has to do with the fact that um, the actual gravity field, because the Earth is not mass homogeneous, then the gravity vector doesn't actually point vertical. <laughs> what we have defined as vertical. It's off a little bit. And we refer to that as deflection of the vertical. And so the, the gravity vector with respect to the reference surface ellipsoid, the gravity vector has a bit of a horizontal component. Now, if you're ignoring that, that's equivalent to saying you've got a horizontal accelerometer here. Now, if your accelerometer is you know, in, a, in a low or medium cost system where you're not really doing long distance navigation, you don't care. Your accelerometers are so large, you know, you, you don't care that, okay, I don't have gravity curve. Even, even at a commercial aircraft level, two nautical mile per hour type system, gravity deflection is not that big of a deal. But if you want the ultimate in performance, certain military customers, then you start needing to take deflection of the vertical into account. And there, the, 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 there, are, uh, there are unclassified data, data, databases of deflection of the vertical. And you'll not be surprised to find out that there are classified versions of databases of deflection of the vertical. And so if you want the ultimate performance, that's how you have to deal with that. So fantastic question. All right, so just to give you a feel for what some of these errors look like, um, this is an example of a static user, 45 degrees north, 100 micro G bias on the north pointing accelerometer. And you can see the position error and the velocity error. Now, obviously, we don't have time to get into the detail, but clearly, this thing is oscillating. And that oscillation is referred to as a Schuler oscillation. It's named after Maximilian Schuler, who, who a little more than 100, 120 years ago, came up with the basic mathematics uh, of how to create a stable gyro compass. Uh, and that mathematical foundation was very helpful when they condensed into commercial navigation about 50 years later. Uh, so it's named in his honor. Uh, and and this period, which is approximately 84.4 minutes, depends on your latitude, uh, is is that is is that frequency, and uh, it has to do with as you as errors start to accumulate, then the gravity vector projects in the opposite direction from the accelerometer errors. You end up with a negative feedback loop. And so uh, you get this oscillating performance. This is this is the classic Schumer oscillation in an American navigation system. Now, notice that I started with uh, I have the North Accelerometer period. That's it. It's, it's the vehicle is actually sitting still, and so you got a cell pointed in the north direction. It's got a box, and now we're just processing the data. 
So you would expect Nord, if you got a Nord accelerometer bias, you would expect Nord velocity error. You would expect latitude error. But how come stuff started going sideways? Where does that cross couple of coming from? Well, it turns out it's said to do to birth rate. We remember we said we had to do birth rate compensation. You know, the fact that you know the earth is rotating and therefore local level is rotating. And it turns out that Earth rate, of course, has two components. If you're sitting at the North Pole, Earth rate is local vertical. Right? But if you go down to the equator, I mean, the, the vector doesn't change direction, right? So if you go down to the equator, where is Earth rate? It's pure north. At the equator, Earth rate is in the local horizontal, which means anywhere in between, You've got a compound of the birth rate that's vertical and a compound of the birth rate that is horizontal. When you have erroneously, you, 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 you're sitting still, but you think you're moving north. So then you think you're at a, at the, at a different position of latitude. That means you're going to compute the wrong components of birth rate. Which means you actually can start thinking that you're turning. And that's where the cross couple comes in. All right, now this is an example of an east gyro bias. And you can see that it's shouldering, but it's shouldering on top of a longer term trend. Which we don't have time to get into the details. It turns out this is the beginning of a very long uh, oscillation, very low frequency oscillation. Uh, that's a function of latitude and the uh, and earth rate. But anyway, the uh, uh, you can see that the sense is uh, increasing for, for a double long degree around a gyro bias. It's increasing at about 100 meters uh, per hour. All right, well, what about noise? You can go through the stochastic processes and you can calculate noise and error growth over a short period of time. This is more critical for low cost sensors uh, that are trying to coast for a short period of time. Uh, the, the, uh, the noise can be an impact there. Uh, I don't have the slides here in this presentation, but if you look at typical for, for a, what we call a NAV grade system, which is the kind that uh, Bill is selling to his military customers. Um, for a nav grade system, the noise errors are pretty small compared to everything else. You look at the cell, you know, Excel gyro bias effects, scale factor, other things, the, uh, the, the noise effects are small. Now, on the short term, to me, that, that thing looks like it's growing like crazy. Well, yeah, over. Five minutes it does, but if you look over an hour, what happens is it, it doesn't continue to grow like that. Um, so the noise effects turn out to be not for a nav grade system, the noise effects are not that big a deal. All right, so what happens when you lump everything together? Uh, so we'll take an example of a flight from New York to Istanbul and put in a nav grade system and see what happens. And what you get is something that looks like that. Now, I've got noise and bias on all six sensors. And when we lump them all together, you can see that it's kind of shimmering, but not perfectly, because all the different sensors are interacting. You got some noise, which of course is contributing a little bit of stochastic nature there. But overall, you can see this, this drip rate. And that's this that's you know when we talk about a system of drifting at you know approximately a nautical mile per hour or something like that, this general trend is what we're talking about. All right, now that's a very oversimplified uh, characterization uh, because it turns out that um, that the duration of the mission has a big impact. So real quickly, take a look at what happens with uh, against some 
uh, NAV rate sensors. And the question is, well, what error dominates the performance? And the answer is it depends on how long the mission is. So this is an example of a two-hour mission. I mean, these are all with no aiding, what we call free inertial navigation, meaning it's free of aiding, it has no external aiding. And I'm looking at the position error, the north error, uh, due to each one of those sensor errors, and then some, and then all of them. And what you can see is that by the end of two hours, the dominant factors are the horizontal gyro bias and the initialization of azimuth, the error in the initialization of azimuth. Excel has a role, but look at the initial velocity error, particularly the vertical gyro bias, has basically no impact. Now, if we go down to 12 minutes, the tactical system, where's the down in the third? It's all the Excel. Right? For the same sensor suite, accelerometer dominates in the short term. Now, if we go to 12 hours, what's the biggest effect? The vertical gyro, which at two hours was negligible. Back here, long enough, all of a sudden it's, it's the biggest error source. So these factors that system designers need to take into account when they're trying to optimize the system for a given mission, for a given customer. What happens if you got low cost stuff? Well, I can make the gyro a problem if it's a low cost enough gyro. Okay? So stuff with the 100 micro G, which is the good, the, the good accelerometer. But if I if I have a sufficiently low cost gyro, then it's it's going to dominate the uh, uh, dominate the error budget. So how do we get rid of drift? And now that we kind of established the uh, overall characteristics of the inertial, let's try to go through this business of aiding. The way we do it is with the technique called the complementary filter. And the idea is that we have two different, each box is a different sensor. I, I, I'll make it practical in a minute. This is going to be an inertial system and this is going to be GPS. Uh, but they're both measuring the same thing, position, you know, whatever. Uh, the, the notion of complementary filter is more general than this. But you got two different sensors, or two different boxes that are, that are measuring the same thing, but their errors, the noise, is different. Uh, one of them is in you know, a classic example. One of them has low frequency errors. One of them has high frequency errors. Hence, they're complementary in terms of their error characteristics. And we can exploit that. So the idea is that I uh, subtract the two. And what happens is if I'm taking truth plus error, first sensor, truth plus error on the second sensor, and I difference them, the truth can hold, which sounds too good, but hold on. The truth can hold, and now I have the sum of the two errors. Now, if one of them is low frequency and one of them is high frequency, then I can make this guy a low pass filter. If this is if this is a low frequency error, I mean, this guy I won't have filter. What I've done is I've extracted the error of this system, and then I can just I can correct. I can correct the output. Now that would that would be the kindergarten approach, but it gives you the idea. By if, if I've got if I've got sensors with complementary error characteristics. Then by differencing them, and I get an observable, which is some of the errors, but with some smart filtering, I can extract the error of interest, which for us is the INS, because as we just showed with all those graphs, the INS error is low frequency. Radio navigation systems, GPS is a great example. Radio navigation systems, at least in the short term, 
are dominated by high frequency errors, noise. They're very noisy. Now, yeah, they have some low frequency errors too, and that makes things more difficult, but we can deal with that. So at, at just a simple level, the inertia with the low frequency error, the radio nanosystem system with the high frequency error, instead of just using, instead of just using a low pass filter, we do something where it's sophisticated and use a statistical estimator. And with some smart in here, it can not only estimate the position error, but it can estimate the velocity error and the attitude error. And if you do your job right, you can actually estimate the sensor errors, the gyro biases and excel biases, if you mechanize it properly. So we uh, we don't have time to get into this, but the Coleman filter assumes that you've got a model. What is it that we're going to be? This is the state vector. Well, what did we just say we were going to estimate? We said we we're going to estimate the inertial errors, inertial position error, inertial velocity error, inertial attitude error, gyro bias, blah, blah, blah. So we need a model. And of course, the Kelman filter works on linear models. So we need a linear model of those inertial errors. And that's captured in the state transition matrix. We also need to be able to relate those items of interest, so the inertial errors, to our measurements. Well, what was the measurement? Well, the measurement where we took the inertial and the GPS and we subtracted them. So that's the measurement. And we've got to be able to relate those guys. And we do that through the data matrix. There's also some model um, uncertainty, which we take into account as well. Now, this is the whole column filter. And I spent another 10 weeks in another graduate course on that. So we're going to go through this quite quickly. Uh, but the idea is that we form um, here. We form a prediction, and the prediction is based on our previous estimates. We got to initialize it somehow, but, but we can form a prediction, and the prediction that uh, it's a function of that state transition matrix, which was the model of how the errors behave over time. And we have to keep track of some statistics of that, but the estimate is equal to the prediction plus some weighting factor times the difference between the measurement and the prediction converted into measurement space. So I'm looking at my actual measurement and my predicted measurement, and then I weight that and on my prediction, and that's my estimate. So the reason the column filter can do the magic it can do is because it has a knowledge of how the system behaves. It doesn't just process the data. It has a knowledge of how the system behaves. It can use that in order to do two things, in order to form intelligent predictions of what it thinks the state is going to be. And then it can form intelligent weighting factors as it weights the prediction and the measurements in order to form an estimate. All right, so we just talked about this. We're estimating errors, so skip past that. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into this, but uh, this is the this is a classic linear model for inertial error, position velocity, attitude errors. And, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through that. Let's get past all this lovely math and get to the uh, get to the implementation. So we talk about in inertial weighting, we talk about loose coupling and tight coupling. Loose coupling is if I'm using process data. What is a GPS output? Well, it outputs position, velocity. Okay, so if you're doing that, you're doing what we call, if you're using that to aid the inertial, you're doing what we call loose coupling. Tight coupling is when you're using measurements, so we'll get to that in a moment. But all right, so I've got the GPS receiver, it processes, it gets the position. It may very well have its own call the filter that introduces other issues. But that either either raw or filtered position velocity data goes into the integration filter. Then we've got the inertial measurement unit, which does all that processing we talked about earlier. The outputs position velocity attitude that goes into the filter as well. The filter does its magic to do what? To estimate all the inertial errors, which then get fed back 
to correct the inertial output. Now, the feedback is important because you need to keep the error small, because if the error is grown too big, then the linear model is, isn't valid anymore. <laughs> so you always feed back the error to keep the uh, error small. Now, this is an example of tight coupling. Big difference is that instead of the receiver outputting position velocity, it's outputting measurements. And the GPS measures things that are proportional to range. Uh, but pseudo range, delta range, carrier phase, different, different observables, but range related measurements is what the GPS receiver outputs. And so the filter then is processing kind of raw measurements rather than process data. It's more complicated because it's like, well, wait a minute. Before we said we were going to take the inertial and the GPS and subtract them. Inertials don't output pseudo ranges. <laughs> How are you going to do that? Well, so we have to take the position and velocity of the satellite, combine that with the position velocity of the output from the inertial, and come up with the equivalent range like observables, which we can then difference with the GPS. So it's more complicated, but it also turns out to be more robust. Uh, and it works better because it, uh, it can factor in a certain issues that the GPS uh, wouldn't. Yeah, please go ahead. I mean, the GPS does not give signals. A signal is not available mm -hmm. to IMS because you have a. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well no, no, you, okay, okay. Maybe I'm associating your question. So you're saying what happens if the GPS stops output? Well, GMS says, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's signal to INS. Yeah, and you're saying what happens if it stops? You know, it contains rates and things. Mm -hmm. So what if the signal is not available? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So if, if, which is a, actually, you're going right to where I'm talking at the end of this, this presentation. When, what happens when it's not working? What happens when the GNSS, GPS, whatever is not working? And in in a classic setup, what would happen is the um, is the system would would call coast. It it would uh, it would well. It, it this output goes away or even temporarily. If it goes away. Then obviously you're not able to, to form any new corrections. So what you're going to do is you're going to um, essentially you're going to extrapolate your old corrections. It's more complicated than that, but that's that's the idea. And and actually that's it's it's a great point because that's why the fallen filter got adopted so early in this business. Is because let's say that your mission is an hour. And let's say that you lose GN, GPS, GNSS, whatever, for the last 15 minutes. So I had it for 45 minutes, but the last 15, it's gone. What do you do? Well, in the old days, you know, if you, you, you would, if, if you had the input data, and you corrected the just did a just did a reset. It's like okay, you know, my inertia was drifted off. Oh wait a minute, I've blown over a known location. Okay, I can reset my position. The drift rate stays the same, but if the filter is getting this aiding and it's been doing that for a while, then and the aiming disappears. Ah, oh, but by that point. Maybe you've already gotten a pretty good estimate of the gyro biases and the Excel biases and these other things. And so hopefully by the time the aiming disappears, you've already calibrated the inertial so much that yes, is it going to drift? Yes, it's going to drift, but not as much as it would have if you hadn't been running the filter. That's kind of the idea. Now, of course, it depends. I mean, if you lose it right away, okay, fine. You can't do anything about it. But, but let me just be blunt about this. In a typical military situation, you're not getting the jamming at your home base. You're getting your jamming where you want to drop the bombs, right? So the, 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 it's working pretty well at the beginning, and it's only at the end of the mission that things go back. And so if, if this is, is doing its job properly, 
then, hey, I can tolerate a certain amount of inertial coasting because I've already calibrated the sensors by that point already. Conceptually, that's, that's the idea. Uh, but yeah, it's a great point about why, why the culture has been so popular. Go ahead. So, uh, you brought up the question point that you, know, you have all these sources of errors mm -hmm. in the view. And with GPS, they're collecting. So, you're calibrating. Mm -hmm. So, are those sources uh, different for every mission? Or yes. No, it, well, okay, it's a little bit of both. So, um, the, 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 uh, the sensors have what we call turn on to turn on biases, meaning every time you turn it on, it's a little different. Now, in order to provide this in context, and we kind of have to draw the way for it, but let's, let's say that, let, let's, Let's say that you, you you have this thing in the lab, and your accelerometer has a you know, pick a number, five hundred micro g bias. You turn it on again. The next time it's five hundred and two micro g's. The time after that it's four hundred and ninety eight. The time after that it's five hundred three. Blah blah blah. And of course, these things are all function of temperature as well. That's another issue. But so you run it over and over and over. Again. It turns out that that the whatever ninety five percent of the bias is repeatable. That's what the laboratory factory, factory calibration is for. You get rid of the bulk of the bias because it is repeatable, and what you're left with is whatever the residual is. Every time you turn it on, it's a little different. As the mission goes on, it changes a little bit. Um, you know, your temperature compensation isn't perfect, all this kind of stuff. So you have a little bit of residual left, and that's what you're dealing with. So, you know, the total bias might be this, but a whole bunch of it you calibrate it out, and so it's just the residual that you're left with. And yes, the, the problem is it's not repeatable. It changes with time, it changes with temperature, it changes every time you apply power to the unit, it changes again. And that's what you're left with. That's what you have to deal with in real time. All right. So let's take a look at a, at a brief example. I've got a simulation of an F-16, does some S-turns as it climbs up to 15,000 feet. It goes west for a while, and then it turns south. So it climbs, does these S-turns, goes west, then they have to turn south. You see it climbing up 5,000, 12,000, almost 15,000 feet. All right, we've got navigation grade inertial. Here's the results. Uh, oh, sorry, and um, uh, I've, got, I've got GPS uh, 80. So the position errors are small, you would expect that. The velocity errors are also small. Well, it's got GPS, you would expect that as well. Attitude starts to become interesting. We see an initial convergence as you're doing those S terms. And then what happens? Well, notice that yaw is an order of magnitude larger than pitch and roll. And so what you can see, and then the, uh, the dashed lines are basically the uncertainty of the filter's estimate. The filter actually computes its own uncertainty. So what you can see is the filter knows it's doing worse as time goes on, and sure enough, the actual error is drifting in the yaw. But then what happens? This is where it made that turn from west to south. And by doing that 90 degree turn, that gave the filter what we call observability uh, in order to be able to identify that yaw error. And so here's the classic illustration of the fact that you can have the world's best call and filter, but if you're not doing the proper maneuvering in order to make certain error sources observable, the filter can't do anything about it. And the, the, 
the, the inertial vendors with the military customers will frequently lament the fact that they're that they'll tell their customers, yeah, you have this long distance mission. Every once in a while, you need to make a turn. You know, the customers go, I don't want to do it. Uh, it's called physics. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a problem. Anyway, let's move on. So I just talked about observability. All right, what about the real world? Well, here's an example. I've got a, a I would say a medium grade inertial uh, GPS inertial that we have in our own flight test aircraft, and uh, this is this is the one that I fly, and um, and this is just an example of some some patterns we were doing around the airport a couple of years ago. Uh, the system uh, is sufficiently accurate that uh, we use it as a truth reference when we're flying systems for other customers. Uh, anyway. So as we wrap up, if we install an inertial in our vehicle, it, it's always there. But what about the aiming source? And the answer, of course, is it won't be. All right. Uh, are we, okay, yeah, that's right. Yep. <laughs> All right. So, um, actually, um, actually, I think it's a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> this is the uh, micro, this is the computer in the, in the truth of this. But anyway, um, you know, here, here we've got uh, Airbus telling his pilots, hey, you know, you may very well lose GNSS. Uh, you've got, is that there? Yeah. You know, study maps, extensive Russian GPS spoofing. You can always tell where Putin is because there's no GPS coverage there. <laughs> they, they've jammed the daylights out of, out of, uh, the, out of the region. Uh, this was an example a few years ago where the military was planning some jamming tests and they published it so that pilots in the area would know and it was functioned out to the I mean, it's a pretty huge chunk of the country that uh, need, people need to be concerned about. Uh, spoofing, as opposed to jamming. Jamming is just like magnetic noise. Uh, spoofing is where the attacker is sending out fake GPS signals. Jamming is, I want to deny your ability to use GPS. Spoofing is, I want to make you think you're somewhere else. And it turns out that nowadays they can do that. When the system was invented 50 years ago, spoofing was almost impossible. But with modern software defined radio technology, spoofing is actually fairly readily done, unfortunately. So here's an example where receivers in the area thought that they were just kind of orbiting this particular location. They weren't, but that was uh, this was reported in the GPS world. So the Coleman is a framework that is readily extensible to a variety of aiding sources. There was nothing I talked about that was specific to GPS. GPS is great if it's available, um, but the Coleman is not so constrained. And so going forward, a lot of people are trying to come up with alternates. Uh, they were. You know, 20 years ago, people wanted to, or 15 years ago, people wanted to come up with a replacement for GPS. That ain't happened. <laughs> we, we spent billions of dollars and decades, of, you know, optimizing that thing, and you're not going to do any better anytime soon. So the alternates need to be thought of as ways to augment GPS, not replace. It. So you have things like what we call signals of opportunity. There are both. Um, uh, who are experts at taking signals from cell towers, which are supposed to be for communication, not positioning. Uh, but they can they can calibrate the signals from cell towers and they can do position determination to within you know 10 meters, you know, something like that. Pretty remarkable stuff. Folks that are using LIDAR, folks that are using electrical optics and infrared, and all of these other technologies are being pursued to be able to be there, not if, but when GPS goes out, you want these things to be ready to fill the gap. And that's what's being pursued. 
so anal sources may come and go. The inertial measurement unit will remain. And that's why I refer to this talk as inertia plus. Plus what? Plus whatever the aiding source happens to be at the time. The inertia will always be there. And it's just a function of what we happen to be aiding it with. So it has been an absolute pleasure being here tonight. I thank you for the fantastic questions. I wish I could extract your brains and put them into my students <laughs> so I can get similarly excellent questions back at home. Uh, but uh, it has been an absolute delight, and I'm happy to stay here as long as you will have me to answer more questions. Thank you very much. Question, please. The size of these plans, how, how, what are the size of the smallest? Oh, okay. Well, all right. So, the for the well, I, I had that picture at the beginning. The inertia, the uh, navigation rate systems are you know currently you know the size of a loaf of bread kind of thing. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, the manufacturers, certainly Northrop, is pursuing. Uh, chip scale sensors, so there is motivation to make the uh, to make the sensors smaller. Uh, there, there, there's as you can imagine, there's a there's a lever arm issue between where the inertial is and where the external sensor is. You know, the GPS depends up on top of the fuselage, and the inertial is someplace inside. Uh, there are folks who have dreamed of the day where the inertia unit could be just buried into the antenna of, of the uh, of, of the GPS, for example. Whether or not that's practical, that's another issue. But but certainly making the making the swap C smaller, you know, the sideway power cost, making that smaller. Folks are working on that. Um, and I'll just mention that there's also a, a parallel effort. Uh, folks that are trying to come up with the next generation sensors. So um, not only do we want to make them smaller, uh, but they like to make them a lot more accurate than they already are. And those those efforts. Are... Yeah, yeah, exactly. The 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 uh, the one the quantum sensors are the ones that are promising, you know, several orders of magnitude improvement in performance. Um, currently, the TRL levels are low. They're still they're working on it. It's, we're a long ways off for production units, but you got to start somewhere. So, you know. David, David, we've been working quantum, you know, atomic to gyro based gyros. Yeah, there's a Musa NMR magnetic resonance gyro, you know, and you know, that there's really you know, we put that those programs that infamous nuclear magnetic resonance okay. gyro. Right? So that that got put to bed in the 80s and then you know about 10 years or so ago, you know, Garfield's got re-interested in quantum instruments, and so we have a and you know the, the NMR has re-emerged right from this Turkish teapot thing down to something about the size of a uh, of a uh, oh, box of matches. And and, it, and it, you know the promise is is like I'm going to give you you know extreme linearity and give you huge angular rates of you know, all this stuff and. It's it's kind of there. It'll be interesting. I don't think I'll see it to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, but 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 that's and then the other stuff that might is the is the is the is the men of Yeah, well actually that's that was always the question. Some questions on the line. Uh so quick quick, thank you for your uh, comment. I appreciate that. Uh and so the question is how how fast do you have to update in you know, order to keep here as a linear? Uh, and of course, that's a function of what kind of sensors you have. I've done simulations with navigation grade sensors where I could let the thing coast for 30 minutes and, and, the, and the model maintain linearity. Uh, about 45 minutes, things sort of funky. Um, but uh, so, so, how often you have to update that's a function of the quality of your sensors. 
if you know the stuff, the stuff that's in your phone, you better be updating them every second. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, uh, it's no good. So that's uh, is there an optimal rate? Yeah, exactly. It's based on the sensor. It depends on it depends on what the sensor. GPS has been, you know, the has been outputting one or two data for 30 years. And so that's kind of standard. But the question is very good. It's like, well, yeah, but couldn't you do it less frequently? And maybe if you were, if you were, you know, constrained computationally, you could do that. And certainly in the past with computational limitations, you know, manufacturers in the past, in the old days, they would update less frequently. That certainly was, was, was done. Then on the second question, uh, but as a matter of fact, um, that already here, the the uh, um, Northrop has been producing navigation grade fiber optic gyros for well over twenty years, uh, and and these are production units in the field. Um, now they are super duper fiber optic gyros. They're not your average dime store fiber optic gyros. They're actually called interferometric fiber optic gyros, and they're they're a heck of a lot more complicated, but they get they get an average performance. So anyway, there was another question. Yeah. Uh, in your equations, you showed that G the gravitation was one of the sources of the mm -hmm. So if if uh, uh, I are you using a spacecraft which mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so how is the drift going to be almost zero? Well, so the space environment is a different animal. Um, I can, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to tell you the best answer I have, which is not totally satisfactory. I spent, I spent my whole career in airplanes, so I, 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 I have very little experience in the space environment. But we, uh, let's see, actually. We didn't talk about this. The it, we talked about the Schuler oscillation in the horizontal errors. It turns out that the vertical is is uh, it, it's a uh, it's an undamped uh, it's it's an hyperbolic room. So whereas the errors in the horizontal uh, are oscillatory, the errors in the vertical are grow without bound. They they're they're literally if you go to the map they're literally hyperbolic. In their growth, um, what's my point? My point is that is that we, you have to have some something to aid the inertial for the vertical. Historically, it was a barometric altimeter, GPS works great, whatever. But you you can't just let it go. It'll 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 head off towards infinity very quickly. And here's the problem with space environment: which is, which is the direction you're falling in? It's a long track, right? By definition, the direction of your orbit is the direction you're falling. And so the, 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 the growth, the error growth and the inertial is in the long track direction on an orbiting vehicle. The radial is not a problem, uh, but it's, it's the long track, which is the big issue. Um, now, how the space guy is actually, I mean, for, you know, for launch, that's obvious. Yeah, I mean, the inertia works conventionally. But when you get when you get to orbit, what they actually do with the inertial systems when they're on orbit, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I mean, it's not my area, and I'm not sure how, how it's done. Uh, but I can tell you the uncertainty is a long track. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so lots of the stuff that we sell for satellites and the like. They don't have accelerometers, they just have gyroscopes with their own being interested in using the inertial package for orientation. And then what they generally do is combine that with a, uh, a star sensor to, you know, bound the, uh, the orientation and they, they use the gyroscope for their short term uh, angular motion. But, and then occasionally some, some suppliers or some customers will want an accelerometer package. But generally, then the only time you really use the accelerometer package is when they're blessing, because they want to be able to make a change in velocity uh, when they're, you know, adjusting their, their position or whatever. Before I forget, we have another question here, but I did, I completely forgot. Bill has a relayer gyro there. Uh, so before you leave, if you've never seen one before, 
you know, take a look at it. It's uh, it's it was the state of the art gyro in 1990. The state of the art in 1985, one introduction in 1990, and this was what we put in. This was 5,000 of a degree per hour uncertainty gyro thing. Was measure uh, up to about a thousand degrees per second with five parts per millimeter. So scale factor accuracy, and that was the state of the art. We stopped making these last year, but that this was the state of the art uh, in, a, in a navigation grade gyroscope up until recently, and it's it's been kind of displaced by the fiber optic gyro over the last twenty years. Why? Because of the fiber optic gyro. It's about the same performance, but it's a fraction of the weight, and it's even more reliable. It's quite reliable, but it's even more reliable, and they're somewhat somewhat cheaper. So, but yeah, if, if these are these are these were amazing instruments, Asian technologies and optics and physics and electrical engineering and lots of stuff. But this is the basic what we call a physics package of a of a little 28 centimeter gyro and bike slots sitting on my bookshelf today. <laughs> now we got to bring, bring that over and stuff in my box. So the last, uh, the last question is one no problem is <laughs> one. Yes. Uh, okay, we'll call a filter and be approved to make more accurate correction for a moving aircraft without external aids like GPS. Uh, that's an interesting question. Of course, keep in mind that the um, the, the, the way on uh, uh, an average system, remember what the column filter is actually estimating is the errors in the inertia. It's not actually directly estimating the the state of the vehicle. You know, the, it's it's correcting the state that the inertial has has uh, call, uh, has computed. Um, but uh, perhaps the present question is: Yeah, but what what happens uh, without uh, without uh, aiding? Um, if if you are if well, okay. If you have no aids, of course, then you're generally just left with whatever we'll call the free inertia performances. The question is: Yeah, can can you? Uh, uh, you know, can you do anything with the filter in order to um, in order to deal with that? Um, not to my knowledge. You need you know, the, the the classic implementation is you need something external in order to serve as an observation of the inertial errors. Uh, it, it, in the old days, it was you know things called flyover fixes. Fly over some no limb that would be an input. Or you use Doppler radar, or you use uh, uh, you know Doppler navigation systems, or ground-based terrestrial aids, or whatever. Uh, but you need something external. Uh, if you have nothing to aid it with, uh, you're pretty much stuck with you know, what we call a free inertia performance. So I can't can't really give you a good good answer beyond that. Uh, last question is space based systems that both polar signal to replace GNSS set coordinates. Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard a little bit about uh, about navigation with pulsars, but I think I've just exhausted what I know about it. So, let's say, <laughs> um, so anyway, thanks again. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Um, I have one. Uh, Mike, so with the with the advent of uh, PicoSat and Microsat and the thousands and thousands of them including the dollars, is anybody looking at those and the signal of opportunity? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. No, yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a colleague of mine. Uh, his name is uh, Zach Cassidus. He was at uh, UC Irvine. He just recently uh, took a position at Ohio State University. My big brother on the road. Um, he's so he's at Ohio State now. Uh, but he's kind of the world's expert in signals of opportunity. And he was starting off with cell towers and that kind of thing. More recently. He's been using things like uh, Starlink satellites. So absolutely, that is being actively pursued as a, as a new signal of opportunity. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Do we have a small gift? Oh, thank the, you very much. My company, I think it's a solar no. power generator. Oh, nice. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.